Unmeasure for unmeasure. What the Germans have done passes understanding, particularly by psychology, just as, indeed, the horrors seem to have been committed rather as measures of blind planning and alienated terrorization than for spontaneous gratification. According to eyewitness reports, the torturing and murdering was done without pleasure, and perhaps for that reason so utterly without measure. Nevertheless, a consciousness that wishes to withstand the unspeakable finds itself again and again thrown back on the attempt to understand if it is not to succumb subjectively to the madness that prevails objectively. The thought obtrudes that the German horror is a kind of anticipated revenge, the credit system in which everything, even world conquest, can be advanced, also determines the actions which will put an end to it and the whole market economy, including the suicide of dictatorship. In the concentration camps and the gas chambers, the ruin of Germany is being, as it were, discounted. No one who observed the first months of National Socialism in Berlin in 1933 could fail to perceive the moment of mortal sadness of half-knowing, self-surrender to perdition that accompanied the manipulated intoxication, the torchlight processions, and the drum beating. How discon disconsolate sounded the favorite German song of those months, Nation to Arms, along the Unterden Linden. The saving of the fatherland, fixed from one day to the next, bore from the first moment the expression of catastrophe that was rehearsed in the concentration camps, while the triumph in the streets drowned all forebodings. This premonition of catastrophe need not be explained by the collective unconscious, though this may clearly have had a voice in the matter. Germany's position in the competition between imperialist powers was in terms, was in terms of the available raw materials and of her industrial potential, hopeless in peace and war. Everybody and nobody was stupid enough to overlook this. To commit Germany to the final struggle in this competition was to leap into the abyss. So the others were pushed into it first, in the belief that Germany might thereby be spared. The chances of the National Socialist Enterprise compensating by record-breaking terror and temporal priority for its disadvantage in total volume of production were minute. It was the others who had believed in such a possibility, rather than the Germans, whom even the conquest of Paris brought no joy. While they were winning everything, they were already frenzied like those with nothing to lose. At the beginning of German imperialism stands Wagner's Twilight of the Gods, that inflamed prophecy of the nation's own doom, the composition of which was undertaken at the same time as the victorious campaign of 1870. In the same spirit, two years before the Second World War, the German people were shown on film the crash of their Zeppelin at Lakehurst. Calmly, unerringly, the ship went on its way, then suddenly dropped like a stone. When no way out is left, the destructive drive becomes entirely indifferent to the question it never posed. It never posed quite clearly, whether it is directed against others or against its own subject.